Good afternoon. It is Tuesday, November 9th, and we're talking about the apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz. Um, I'm in camp gear because it's um, National Wear Your Camp T-shirt Day, so um, I'm I'm repping Azrui. Uh, and um, now, Rabbi, tell us about this movie. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk about it, and uh, it is. Uh, was in its time controversial and continues to be controversial. So uh, I think perhaps controversial right here in our own discussion. So we'll see, um, you know, as we go on. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about the people who made it and uh, and those kinds of things. Some of them are familiar, of course, to you, like Richard Dreyfuss. Uh, this is really his first big starring role. Actually, this predates uh, Jaws by a couple of years. He kind of made his, uh, that's uh, the wrong movie there on my screen. <laughs> yes, it, it's, oh, wait, am I still? Yeah. yeah the but these are just, tonight. Yeah. You know, it it comes up, you know, this is what comes up. I, I don't think they have anything from Duddy Kravitz. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, the, you know, that's a scene from uh, what we're talking about tonight. Oh, A Serious Man. Yeah, that's Cy Abelman from uh, Serious okay. Man. There, right. so I'm not sure what you're on at the moment. Well, but uh, thing. hopefully okay. folks can hear me. Um, but uh, so uh, Richard Dreyfus, um, you know, shortly before this, he made sort of his first splash in the movies. He was in uh, American Graffiti, directed by um, uh, Lucas. Uh, but um, but this was his first real starring role. I mean, he was he was not top billed in American Graffiti, uh, which was more of an ensemble cast anyway. It's a few years before he wins an Oscar for Goodbye Girl, and um, and you know so so he was not very well known when he made this movie. Um, uh, the uh, director is a guy named Ted Kotcheff. Uh, Ted Kotcheff was born in Toronto in 1935 uh, from Bulgarian Jewish parents. Uh, he he went to a Jewish summer camp and uh, things like that. Um, he is not, well, he's, he's well known in, in Canada for his work, but to be honest, he, uh, uh, he did, made some movies in America that were pretty uh, well known. I mean, in particular, uh, he made the movie First Blood, which um, uh, is the, the beginning of the character Rambo with Sylvester Stallone. Um, he um, made the movie Weekend at Bernie's, uh, if you know that comedy. Uh, he was a producer of Law and Order SVU for 12 years, right? So he's had a long and, and productive career. Uh, he uh, collaborated with the writer of this book, uh, The Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz, and then actually did two more films with the, that author, Mordecai Richler, uh, a movie called uh, Fun with Dick and Jane, and uh, a, another one based on a Richler novel called Joshua Then and Now. Uh, all of which are worth seeing, I, mean, I think. Um, so let's talk about the writer. Uh, he actually got an Oscar nomination for best screenplay for this movie, right? So it didn't win, but it was nominated. Uh, Mordecai Richler was born in Montreal. So both Ted Kotcheff and Mordecai Richler are Canadian. Uh, he was born in 1931. I didn't see an obituary for Ted Kotcheff. I, he was born in 35. I think he's still alive. Mordecai Richler died in 2001. Um, a well-known um, uh, author, uh, his book Solomon Gursky was here, was nominated for the, the Booker Prize. Uh, so a celebrated author. Um, his, his own father was a scrap metal dealer, which uh, is perhaps interesting in terms of this one of his early books. So this novel, if I remember correctly, was uh, published in 1952. Um, and Ted Kotcheff and Mordecai Richler, as fate would have it, uh, were roommates. They, they actually were both trying to make it in the arts in, in Canada in the 1950s. Uh, they spent some time in, in London but they were actually roommates. So the story goes that when Mordecai Richler wrote this story, uh, Ted Kotcheff said, let's make a movie of this. And then 30 years later, you know, 25 years later, 
or something. They they uh, uh, managed to get a script and and get things going. Uh, some of that had to do with uh, I think the Canadian Film Board uh, came along and was uh, trying to finance feature films in Canada. They still do today. Um, there there aren't uh, movie studios like there are in America. And so. Um, so that, but they were trying to compete with American films. So the 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 government of Canada subsidizes the film industry in Canada. Um, you may know some of uh, Mordecai Richler's other books, um, particularly Barney's version, which I think was his last novel before he died. I think that's also been turned into a movie as well. Um, uh, Richler's, uh, I, I mentioned his father uh, Moses was a scrap metal dealer. Uh, his maternal grandfather was a rabbi, um, so so grew up in, in the Jewish tradition. Uh, a lot of people compare Richler to Philip Roth, um, the, particularly in this, uh, as I think people were talking about as, as I came on, uh, this sort of jaundiced view, perhaps, of, uh, of the Jewish community, right? Um, but I think that there are some significant differences between the two. Uh, um, uh, and one that I'd point out for this movie in particular, but where a, a fair amount of Philip Roth's work, especially his early work, has to do with Jewish mothers and Jewish sons. Richler's work tends to deal with Jewish fathers and sons. And so, um, you know, so I, I don't know if that's just the difference between authors or if it says something deeper about uh, uh, the Jewish community in Canada, vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish community in America, I can't really say, but um, but but they were both uh, willing to sort of portray the Jewish community, let's say, warts and all, right? Uh, and uh, and there's a lot of warts in in this one. So um, uh, mentioned briefly some of the other people in the movie, just uh, probably don't know the the actress who plays Yvette, but she's a, a pretty big deal in in Canada. She was born in Montreal. She's won the Canadian uh, equivalent of the Oscar. And um, uh, she actually goes on to be a director as well and directed several films uh, financed by the Canadian Film Board. So uh, and has appeared in, you know, hundreds of TV shows and movies in Canada. So she's very well known. Um, more familiar to you is probably Jack Warden, who plays uh, Duddy's father, Max, in this movie. Um, you know, he was he was not Jewish, uh, but uh, uh, sometimes, you know, in some of the websites and stuff I saw, there was some claim that uh, he had some Jewish ancestry. Um, you know, maybe only in Hollywood is it uh, to your advantage to claim Jewish an ancestry. But uh, so it depends on what website you read. But as far as I can tell, he was not uh, Jewish, uh, certainly not in practice, and I think not uh, biologically in any way. Well, but, uh, you know, uh, the list of movies that he was in um, goes on and on. But you may remember him from a couple of things. Uh, he was actually nominated for an Oscar for... Uh, uh, his part in Heaven Can Wait uh, with uh, Warren Beatty. Um, also nominated for another movie with Warren Beatty, Shampoo, a couple of years before that. But uh, I think he made a screen debut in From Here to Eternity. Uh, he made a, a splash on screen in 12 Angry Men as one of the, the members of the jury, um, the one who's most impatient and wants to get out. Um, so uh, as Chicago... Uh, uh, Bears fan, some of you may remember that he's in the movie Brian's Song. He plays George Papa Bear, George Hallis, in the movie Brian's Song. So a lot of different things. He was in Being There with Peter Sellers, and uh, um, where I think he plays the president of the United States, if memory serves. And uh, he's also in All the President's Men, and he's um, Paul Newman's law partner in The Verdict. Right. So a lot of different things that he's been in. Um, you may have recognized Randy Quaid, uh, Randy Quaid, who had a, 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 also an actor who was nominated for an Oscar. He was nominated for his role in The Last Detail with Jack Nicholson. Um, uh, he plays Virgil in this movie. Uh, he had roles in The Last Picture Show. Yeah, this is what he looks like now, that big bushy beard, and has become... Uh, 
well known as a kind of a crackpot, actually. So uh, I don't know that he's appeared on screen in anything in a very long time, um, but uh, has become a kind of a right wing conspiracy theorist and a strange, strange fellow. But um, uh, but he had probably the last movie I think he may have appeared in was actually he had a part in Brokeback Mountain, um, the Ang Lee movie a few years, several years ago now. Uh, you may know Denholm Elliott, who is a, a very good character actor, plays the uh, um, plays the movie director in this movie, the, the one who uh, that he partners with to make bar mitzvah films. By the way, I have to point out that almost everybody videotapes their weddings and bar mitzvahs now. You know, when when Mordecai Richler wrote this idea down on Panhattan, he should have patented or something, you know, right? And then made into the movie. But you gotta say, uh, that was outlandish. This idea that people would film a bar mitzvah you know, I, I'm, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, I, what would you call it? I, it? You know, it turns out to be prescient, I guess. And at the time was outlandish, you know, what an outlandish idea this is. Um, so, but, um, but so Denham Elliott plays the, uh, that he also has been nominated for an Oscar. He was nominated for an Oscar for a room with a view. And, um, also appeared in, uh, he's got a part in Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Steven Spielberg movie, uh, uh, five years after this or so. Uh, he was in the movie Trading Places with Dan Aykroyd and uh, 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 Eddie Murphy. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, so he shows up uh, in a lot of things from time to time. Um, Joe Silver, who plays uh, one of the, one of the more minor characters, just mention him because he may have looked familiar to you. Um, he plays the scrap metal dealer who hires uh, Duddy to, you know, becomes a, a kind of a mentor figure for him. Um, you know, he appeared in many movies as well. Probably the, uh, he was in the Goldbergs, the TV series, one of the first uh, uh, TV shows back in the 1950s uh, that um, was based on that uh, radio series, the Goldbergs. So um, he was in the movie Clute with Jane Fonda. Um, he was in the movie Death Trap uh, based on the book uh, or play, I guess, by Ira Levin, right? Um, Joseph Wiseman, who plays uh, the uncle in this movie, uh, just, you know, can't resist pointing him out because he was Dr. No in the first James Bond movie. Uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, list of credits that he's in. Um, uh, he off, Other than Dr. No, he often played a Jewish character on screen. He was in uh, Bye Bye Braverman, which is a movie maybe we'll watch one of these days. Uh, uh, he was in the, the TV miniseries QB7. Uh, he was in the Elie Wiesel play that was televised, Zalman or the Madness of God. Um, he was in the TV miniseries Masada. So, uh, so a lot of things where he, um, um, he also was born in Montreal, by the way. So there, there's a whole sort of Canadian connection thing going on in this movie. Uh, and last not but least, I have to point out Zvi Schooler again, right? This is the guy who's been in more of these movies than anybody else that we've seen. Uh, he's 80 in this movie. So we just saw him last week in Hester Street playing the rabbi in the scene with the get. Uh, he was in The Chosen. He, he, he plays uh, a rabbi in The Chosen. Uh, he plays the rabbi in Fiddler on the Roof, right? Um, he's uh, one of the, the, the neighbors to one of the victims in No Way to Treat a Lady. Uh, I mean, we've seen him over and over. Uh, it's a pretty interesting niche career that he carved out for himself. But uh, um, you know, uh, he, he's, this is one of his largest roles. Um, he plays, uh, the Zaydi who of course tells him that a, a man without land is nothing, right? Which in some ways, uh, spurs the, the whole plot of this movie is, is Duddy Kravitz trying to live up to his, what his grandfather tells him, uh, 
getting the message and missing the message at the same time, right? So Zvi Scholar's role here is very important. As, just a, as a joke, a couple of years later, Zvi Scholar appears in a Woody Allen movie, which you may remember, called Love and Death. Um, and he plays an old man who's constantly talking about his piece of land, which he carries around with him. It's like a piece of sod, and, um, and he carries it wherever he goes. And it's kind of a direct uh, parody and a joke uh, of the character he plays in uh, The Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz. So, um, so th those are the folks who made the movie. Um, the, uh, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the title itself, right? And then what takes place in the movie. So uh, generally speaking, an apprentice and works with somebody to learn a trade, right? I mean, that's that's what an apprentice does. So if Duddy, Duddy, if this is the apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz, who is he the apprentice of, right, in this movie? And, and it's an interesting question. And I would suggest that uh, um, there are several characters in the movie who in some way or another are the kind of uh, uh, the, the teacher to, to Duddy Kravitz, right? Um, uh, he certainly doesn't have a formal apprenticeship with anybody, but there are a number of uh, people who be, he becomes sort of connected to in one way or another who uh, serve as his mentor figures. Uh, one might also think of them as father figures, right? That this, uh, um, you know, his own father being, uh, um, you know, somewhat inadequate and, and certainly not uh, successful in the way that Duddy hopes to become successful or even how the, the, the father wants Duddy to become successful, right? Um, you know, he has a series of sort of, uh, um, of fathers who are not, uh, you know, not uh, really good role models, right? So, so interesting to think about the movie and its title and that kind of thing, a young, impressionable man trying to learn how to be a success and something is missing, right? Because um, uh, uh, so that, that's something we can definitely talk about as, through. So, um, so you see that there, that, you know, everyone from you know, the character of his father, the character of his uncle, uh, certainly, uh, the the scrap metal dealer, right? The uh, the boy wonder, and all of these are, uh, in some sense or another, you know, his mentor figures, and, and of course the Zeta, you know, his grandfather. So I, I think, in some ways, the, this movie is about uh, uh, learning how to become a success and learning the wrong things, right? So, um, so, so I, I think it's very interesting, I, you know, so, um, I, as I said, it's a controversial work and, um, there's probably plenty to discuss. So I'm, I'm curious to hear how folks reacted to it. I, I, I do think that it's a, a, a great performance from, uh, um, from Richard Dreyfuss, um, I, you know, uh, probably a better performance than the performance he won an Oscar for in uh, The Goodbye Girl, probably better than the performance he's nominated for in Mr. Holland's Opus. Uh, I, I think that uh, looking back, the, first of all, a, a much, uh, um, uh, what would you call it? a much chancier sort of role, you know? Um, uh, do, do we sympathize with him? Um, if we do at all, it's only because of Richard Dreyfus, right? I, I mean, this is not a, I, I don't, none of us would say, this is, this is how we would like our children to behave, you know? Um, the, but I, I think it's very complex. So um, one of my favorite uh, scenes is him playing, uh, we didn't mention him as a mentor figure, but uh, Hugh, uh, the, the wealthy, um, waspy, if you like, man that he plays billiards with, right? who he has originally has to go see to, uh, um, to try and save his uh, brother's academic career, right? And he goes and sees him and he plays billiards with him. 
um, and uh, deliberately loses, right, uh, in the first time they play together. The second time we see it, we, we see that Duddy, uh, yeah, he could have beaten them any time he wanted to, right? It was, it was useful to him to not be seen as, as a better billiards player than him. But he has this conversation with Hugh about uh, how many generations did it take for your, you know, for your hands to be clean, right? You know, and, and that's that's a very interesting thing to point out, right? Um, you know, that uh, um, a generation succeeds so that the next generation doesn't have to, to struggle the way they did, right? Um, doesn't have to be cutthroat in business the way uh, um, the, the character, um, you know, um, Joe Silver's character, the scrap metal dealer has to be, right? Um, so if you juxtapose that scene of playing billiards where he's talking to him and, uh, um, you know, they have this conversation about uh, uh, how, uh, how many generations, you know, I'm sure your grandfather's hands are not as clean as yours, right? Or the uh, scene in the steam bath with Joe Silver, right? Where he admits to him that someone died on his scrap metal lot, that it was his fault, but he had a partner who wasn't as smart as he is, right? So his son will never have to do anything like that. Right. So um, so I, I, I think the, the movie is not without nuance, right? about these characters so i see uh mary has a hand up i think so ready to have some discussion you have to unmute though mary i i didn't change the settings for this. there you go mary okay. no 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 i did my hand was not up i was just <laughs> oh you were just <laughs> yeah the only thing that i thought was what you know what's interesting is that he this is an aside he his uncle offers him his business mm -hmm. in his deathbed right and yeah. he turns it down. And that is the next, because you're talking about generation, that is the next generation where you can have cleaner hands. That is the way out. And he he didn't take it. Right. There, there's an element of pride there, right? That, uh, you know, um, I, I think that character uh, is very interesting. And that uh, kind of deathbed visit scene is a really interesting scene where the, the uh, uncle is you know, maybe seeing Duddy for the first time and maybe realizing that if he had given him a different kind of guidance, you know, maybe something different would have happened if he had recognized his ambition, but shaped it in the proper way might have been different, right? You know, um, and, and by the end of that scene, there's a little bit of uh, uh, coming together of the uncle and Duddy, right? And so when he leaves as the doctor's coming in it's as if you don't let him die that's my uncle right you know um there there's a little bit of you know uh the importance of family and and so as i said not without nuance there's uh you know obviously there are things we can point at in this character and say uh, this is a this guy belongs in jail right i mean he he committed fraud um you know he forged a check by the end of the movie, I mean, sort of step by step, you know, he's he's been a courier for heroin across the border, right? Uh, I mean, things that um, somewhere along the line he could have stopped doing the things that he's doing, but he continues to do them, right? But at the same time, you also see that there are these moments. Um, uh, Yvette says it uh, at a certain point, uh, um, pretty early on when they go off and. Uh, can't remember. I, it's not when they have a picnic together. It's just before that, where um, she says, "It's it's so nice to see you like this, sitting still." <laughs> and that's one of the beauties of this performance is it's in in constant, almost perpetual motion, and the uh, the scratching. You know, <laughs> he's literally scratching at his own flesh uh, most of the time. Right? Um, it's 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 a very interesting thought and portrayal. There are some hands up. I, I didn't yeah, Susan and then Linda. Uh, when you talk, Rabbi, about this being a controversial film, um, I guess I can add to the controversy. Yeah. Because I found uh, it, if I was sitting next to a non-Jew watching this movie, 
I would be terribly embarrassed mm -hmm. because I felt like it was a rampant advertisement for anti-Semitism. Yeah. It may it just put Jews in a horrible light. And it really bothered me. Well, I I mean, like I said, his character is is on the whole negative, right? If we have any yes. sympathy for him, it's with uh, uh, because of Richard Dreyfus's portrayal of it. Right. Um, but on the other hand, you have Svi Skoller's character, you yes. know, the lady. You That's know, true. Um, you have the uncle, right? Who has, you know, says things to him. I've never hired anybody to spy on my employees. You know, he runs a union shop. Um, he uh, takes care of his workers. Right. I, I mean, so there there are some uh, positive characters in yes, here. Yes, there are. I just I guess no. I felt that Richard Dreyfus his performance was so overwhelming and so yeah. major to the entire film that I guess that I was so focused on that. Yeah. <laughs> and it and so it, turned me off. And I had seen this movie many years ago, but I I didn't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the interest. A lot of these movies, I think some of us have seen in previous generations, you know, mm -hmm. and they're different. I, and it certainly was controversial when it came out for exactly the reasons that you're talking about, Susan. The, the question, uh, a question the Jews often ask about themselves is, well, how will it play in Peoria? Right. right. You know, right. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. I mean, right. Uh, um, now, is the movie untruthful? Uh, I mean, is it does it not portray uh, some characters that we ourselves may have known at some time or certainly heard about. Uh, uh, I think, you know, it, it makes its points, right? But it and doesn't only happen in Jewish society. No. It happens in <laughs> other cultures as well. Yeah, and the movie sort of argues that as well. You know, so the immigrant generation comes over and they do what they can, right? Uh, my, my grandfather was a junk dealer, you know? So was um, mine. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, he did whatever he could, right, to, to make it in this country. And my father was the first one of his brothers to go to college. Um, you know, the, the third brother in the family, you know, but, but by then, you know, he could work his way through college, right? And that changes the trajectory of the whole family, in a sense, is once that can happen. Um, and, and we see it sort of played out in this family, too. You've got one brother who's sort of the favored brother, he's going to medical school. Um, and the other brother is, uh, um, you know, he, he's not college material, let's say, right? Okay. So, um, and, and that's sort of a fascinating thing here too. I mean, the, the, the notion of class in this, even within the Jewish community, right? The way the, uh, the college boys at camp treat Duddy, um, you know? Um, the way that same college boy, Irwin, is responsible for uh, Duddy's brother doing an illegal abortion, mm -hmm. right? If, if you caught that detail, yes. right? So, um, so it's a class thing. I mean, they're both in medical school together. Why didn't Irwin do it? Well, no, wouldn't, wouldn't, you know, Irwin can't do that. It's not, uh, uh, he's not of the class to do that, right? He's, he's, he's keeping his hands clean, so to speak. So. Uh, I think Linda was next, yeah? Yeah, um, I had a similar observation like Susan did. I was embarrassed of some of the scenes, but my question to you is, um, I know from previous movie groups, you open, you always analyze the opening scene and the closing scene. Yeah. And I'm trying to wrap around how that marching and the music of the mm -hmm. opening scene and it shows up in the middle of the music was yeah. representative of the what was going on. That's a good question. Yeah, I think that it's it's really interesting. I mean that uh, that scene at the beginning of him marching with the cadets, the high school cadets, I guess, through uh, uh, through the neighborhood of Jewish Montreal, you know, and it's another way to uh, um, to assimilate, right, to become a part of the the. Uh, larger community, things like that. So it, uh, um, and the other boys are sort of marching in line and marching in step and Duddy is screwing around, right? right. You know, and I think that that uh, tells us, uh, I, I mean, it starts that portrayal, you know, the, the, 
I mean, he can't sit still. We all know some boys like that, right? Yeah. He can't, he can't sit still, right? Uh, you know, um, uh, and uh, so he, he's constantly pushing and picking at the other guys and, you know, just uh, getting out of line, right? And I think that that's maybe, if you want to think about that as a metaphor for his character through the movie, he gets out of line, right? He keeps, uh, you know, he, he's got a goal he's headed towards. He'll do anything to get there. And and we see that as we go on. It's It's one thing to sort of, even somewhat unknowingly uh, do what he does for the boy wonder, you know, um, uh, the, taking drugs across uh, the lines. I mean, of course he has his suspicions and then knows what he's doing by the time he does it, but he's willing to do that for money. But that's not as bad as what he does at the end. No, no. Uh, no. And then I have one other question about the whole bris scene. I didn't understand that movie with the bris. Yeah. I mean, that was such a collage yeah, with, the of, of, with the Nazis and the airplane right. yeah. and everything that was thrown in there. And I didn't know what the symbolism of all right. of that was supposed to be. So, so I don't know that you're supposed to understand it, right? I mean, we're, we're watching a movie within a movie that's supposed to be a movie made by essentially a, 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 a yeah. drunken, you right. know, Maybe he's a hack, maybe he's not. I mean, we, we can't say that for sure. But, uh, you know, he's clearly a drunk, right? right? And he says right from the start, you know, I'll make this movie, but no, you know, no, you can't have anything to do with the, you know, my directorial choices, right? Um, so uh, so Duddy has nothing to do with that. It's, it's the vision of this director who says right from the start, I see this as the, you know, a, a manhood ritual, like the rituals of the, uh, you know, African tribes and stuff. And so that, uh, so as, as a movie within a movie, it's, it's a very uh, um, strange and, you know, like I said, nowadays, we take it for granted that these things are taped and, and that it's an industry, you know, to tape your kids bar mitzvah. But this, uh, this is the first one, right? I, I mean, not just the first one, in this community that's created in the movie. It's the first one, right? I mean, it's like, I don't know how many people saw this movie and said, you know what, that's an idea for a business. <laughs> but, um, you know? If I remember correctly, years ago, you couldn't bring a camera into the synagogue yeah. and take a picture. So I don't know when all of the pictures were allowed to be taken or, or uh, a filming of bar mitzvahs. I don't know when that, but right. I know when I was a kid, you couldn't do it. You couldn't sure. bring a camera in. Right. So the rules have changed some. I mean, we, a lot of places still have certain rules. We always had rules. We told people not to use cameras during services, you know. Um, and then we started saying, well, OK, if, the, if you hire a video guy, they can stand at the back and turn on the camera, but they can't be running around taking pictures and you know, and, and gradually now everybody's got a camera in their pocket. Right. So it's very hard to tell people. Uh, play, and now, especially in the time of COVID, right, we're dependent on the cameras, right? right. So the, the, you know, we're having this class because we have cameras, right? Because, you know, it's a, what allows us to be together. So uh, it's gone from being like, oh, no, that you can't use a camera in the sanctuary to uh here it is so i don't know that you're supposed to fully understand everything you know but the vision of this director is to sort of uh in the space of uh uh the five minute uh i'm sure it's less than that on in screen time right in the the video of this bar mitzvah the whole history of the jewish people and the parallel from uh, uh the ritual of the zulu manhood ritual so, you know, you get in that, in that movie, you get both, uh, you know, African drums and Havana Gila, right? And you get the, this um, ridiculous final shot of uh, Mr. Farber and his son outside of Farber uh, right. Ironworks, you know, with the cigar and the, you know, it's, it, right, passing, passing it on from generation to generation, you know? So, um, uh, so I, I think it's an inspired little bit in the movie. It's one of my favorite parts, you know, and, and 
uh, it, it, and he says, right, but it starts with blood and the bris and the, you know, and sometimes. Uh, I mean, it was just all over. I mean, I, I could understand it was, to me, it was like a Woody Allen yeah, uh, type of movie uh, with yeah. everything in there. So I, I just yeah. wondering if that had any symbolism. Either. Right. You've, you've got the guy who, for no apparent reason, shows up in there who's eating razor blades and right. glass and. Right. <laughs> That's the, you know, what, what is that image supposed to be, right? So it has nothing to do with the history of the Jewish people, but it's, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of, but it's a great juxtaposition of uh, the fancy lunch that they're eating, you know, for the bar mitzvah reception and this guy chewing glass, right? It's very, it's very funny, I think. But, uh, um, you know, and the voiceover of the whole thing, uh, um, you know, very, very somber, very, well, the story of how one Hebrew babe and how he's accepted into his tribe, right? It sounded so, like Denholm Elliott's voice. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he was, yeah. the, he was the narrator as well. Because it, you right. know, it classes uh, there's it There's even up. a little communist thing thrown in there, right? Because it, he tells us, you know, I, I can't do this. I'm on the blacklist, right? And, uh, and, and so, so here's one of the things where you might, yeah, I, I'm, you know, look, uh, Duddy Kravitz is crassly commercial, but he does give work to a guy who's on the blacklist, <laughs> right? You know, I, I mean, it's, it's a little, you know, does that, it doesn't redeem him, but it, it's, you know, the, the mix ups in his character, right? But he says uh, something about, um, he, uh, there's, there's a little scene in there where uh, of the boy and the rabbi who's handing him the book, the, the rabbi's handing him his own book that he wrote, right? And the, the, the voiceover says something about, he's told something of the tragic history of his race um, and something about diverting the working classes from the true source of their misery, right? So, so there's the, the, the little bit of the blacklist, you know, a uh, uh, little bit of the, of the communist manifesto gets in there as well so uh, uh and everybody sits dumbfounded at the end until the rabbi turns to mr farber and says what an edifying experience it's a work of art at which point the whole business is a success for duddy kravitz right because all of farber's uh now all of farber's you know uh relationships they all have to have one too exactly yeah um, yeah. Alice has her hand up. Uh, yeah. um, I wanted to comment. One of the things that I focused, or the main thing I think that I focused on in watching the movie was the family dynamics. And Rabbi, you, you started talking about this and it was what really got to me was how the one generation really boxed in um, Duddy and his brother as, you know, you're going to medical school and you're, I don't know what they thought Duddy was going to do, but it's just like, I, I felt that, um, that was, there was not, a, I mean, I think it's common for people to do, but I think it's not healthy. Yeah. And, and I think Duddy kind of fought against that the whole, you know, the whole movie, his whole life. And, um, and, and, I think maybe that, you know, was part of the reason at the end when his uncle was dying that he didn't accept the business. You know, he, he thought he was a, a nothing all this time. And now, you know, on his deathbed, he's, he's giving him the bit, you know, he's gonna give him the business. So I, I thought that to me, that was a really interesting um, part of the movie. Um, also, I, you know, just, I have to comment, you know, talking so much about the movie and the movie. To me, I thought that was hysterical. I mean, I just like, was like, what? You've got the Zulus and the Briss and the, the and the guy, as you just said, you know, eating the, the razor blade, whatever. And it, it's almost like an emperor has no clothes thing. You know, as soon as the rabbi said, oh, it's okay, then, you know, because I think everybody's sitting there probably felt like we did kind of uncomfortable. Like, what is this? And is this appropriate? And, and then all of a sudden, oh yeah, you know, as soon as the rabbi said it was okay, it was, it was okay. I, I, 
I just thought it was it was very um, in keeping with the rest of the movie. Just you know, this everything was over the top. But I think in doing that, it made some really interesting um, made some very interesting um, commentary on life, as you said, not just for Jews, but for you know the different generations of you know immigrant families and how they how they cope and how they adapt. Right. right. Yeah, I, and you know, um, just a last thing about that movie in the movie, right? I mean, it starts with Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. You know, I, you know, could be more pretentious than that, right? And then uh, I think there's a line: uh, "More intricate than a snowflake," right? The uh, uh, is the bar mitzvah. <laughs> Just the way it says it. It's very, very funny, I think. Um, but but the scenes leading up to it, right? When he goes to Farber to get him to uh, and and Farber says to him over and over, "You're such a liar with with such affection," right? I mean, that's yeah. You'll you'll go far because you're such a liar, right? And. And in the end, tells him, "Okay, I know it costs uh, what it costs you maybe six hundred dollars. I'll give you seven fifty if I like it." He says, "Now you go to uh, I forget the the guy he says, sends him to. Uh, you go to Schwartz and tell him that I gave you two thousand dollars. Let him call me, you know, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, so that's how this guy takes him under his wing in a sense and and gives him." On the sense that, yeah, you want to be successful, lie, 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 lie. That's right. You know, well, they, they still, we still hear it now. Fake it till you make it, right? You know, um, uh, dress for success, right? Dress for the job you want to have, not the one you have, right? All of those things, right? They're all uh, um, less extreme versions of of exactly what goes on here. You know, he see he meets Virgil on the train. He's got nothing, he's carrying drugs across the border uh, and gives him his card. And, and uh, you know, you've got uh, pinball machines. Okay, I'll take those off your hands, right? You know, I mean, it's uh, the constant wheeling and dealing, uh, again, sort of the constant motion. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's exaggerated, but it's exaggerating from something, I think, right? You know, um, and by the way, I, I, someone asked, I think it was Linda asked about the last scene too. I'd say the very last scene, um, you know, he comes out of the, the diner, what's it called, Walensky's, um, and doesn't know what direction to go in. Did you notice? He goes to the left a few feet, and then he goes to the, and, and I don't think that's just an accident. I mean, I think that's part of it too. You know, here is this character, he's gonna run somewhere, but you don't know where, and he doesn't know where, you know, and, and I think that that's where it leaves him is that this, um, you know, is he a success? Is he not a success? He's a success because now he can charge stuff at Walensky's, right? He's got a, he's got a charge account, but, but, you know, he is on some level, you, you can never tell whether his motives are pure or not, right? Um, you know, um, when he goes to see Virgil and Yvette at the farmhouse and, and stays there for a while, is, is this all calculated? Is it all about, uh, or, or I think he really feels bad about what happened to Virgil, right? But he also wants to be released from indemnity for it. <laughs> you know, uh, in the end, uh, because of this connection to Virgil, he's able to finance the, the last money for that parcel of land right you know so so it's a very uh, uh everything in him is a mixed up you know what direction to go in uh and i think that he uh, and and so what's missing you know so first of all to, and do you want to say there, there's also i think it's very quick but very poignant about um uh he asks about his mother who apparently died when he was a boy, and he asked his father, "Did she like me?" Right. So I, th I think kind of a strange question to ask, but but tells us a lot about uh, this character's need, right? A, a, a need for love and acceptance that he doesn't really have anywhere, 
right? Um, except maybe from a vet, right? But he doesn't know how to, doesn't know how to have that. I mean, over and over, you know, he, he says that, how often does he say the wrong thing to a vet in this movie, right? Uh, don't tell anybody about this land, I'll give you $50, <laughs> right? You know, um, all he had to do was ask. She wasn't going to tell anybody, right? Um, you know, but, but he can only think in terms of money. And, and so over and over, he says the wrong thing to her. I mean, he's, he's hungry for love and doesn't know how to receive it, right? Um, so I, I think that's very poignant, actually. It's, it's, so there are moments when I can sympathize with, with you know, how, how somebody can be turned into the kind of uh, person he is, right? Growing up all his life on, the, on the, his father's stories about the boy wonder, you know, his, his close friend who doesn't know him from Adam, right? Um, but how he turned, you know, reselling bus transfers into a fortune. You know, I, I'm, these are the things that Duddy heard growing up and they're the things that he internalizes. Even his, his Zadie, who is the closest thing to a moral conscience really in the movie, right? Um, uh, you know, telling him over and over, the man without land is nothing, you know, um, which comes out of, of course, his experience of coming from, you know, first generation immigrant uh, coming over from a place where Jews were not allowed to own land, right? So, um, so all those things become a part of Duddy's character and the movie is about them. Uh, Ed, were you waving your hand to say something or just exercising? Ed? Did you want to no. no, no. know? Alice crazy. wants to say something. Yeah, okay. You know, Rabbi, I was just gonna, I, as you were saying it, I, that's what I was thinking. I think it's really important that he's a, he's a motherless child. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that really plays a huge part. Um, you know, mothers and fathers, I think give different things to their children. And his father was uh, was like, I think trying to, instill in him this ambitious thing. But I, I, I think probably if he had a mother, she would have tempered that with, you know, how you go about doing that as, you know, as a good person. Right. I, you know, right. That's what I'm imagining. But I think- per, Perhaps the uncle too could have done that, right? You know, I mean, the, the uncle on his deathbed says, I'm sorry, I didn't see what your grandfather saw. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying is I think people, you know, put him into a certain box and then they didn't see any, any yeah. potential, unfortunately. And um, yeah. So is there any hope for him? <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. And? Well, I, I just wanted to make the comment that in my opinion, uh, he treats everybody in the movie from his brothers to his uncles to his father, everybody like crap, yeah. with the exception of Zadie. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, you know, it's it's a, it's a weird situation. But basically, uh, uh, however he was brought up, he was always on on the take on the sly. He was a no good Nick. Yeah. But for hey, Zadie, about, he had love. But what about when he went to um, get his brother reinstated? Yeah, when he goes off to see Hugh. I mean, that's... that's right. Now, it, right, if, if his brother doesn't get back, you know, this is where I say, you never know what his motives are. Uh, right. He gets there and he makes a relationship with Hugh that yeah. right, he thinks will be useful to him as time goes on. So that, you know, so... Uh, at the very least, he's killing two birds with one stone, right? But but there is kind of a sense of, okay, so here he is sort of stepping out of his, his character. But of course, if his brother doesn't get back into school, then it's all on Duddy for the rest of his life, right? Who's going to support the brother yeah. now, right? Um, so so it's all mixed up in, in, in the movie and in his life and in his head, I think. But But you're right. I mean, he does go to this guy, goes above and you know, he, he does a brotherly thing, let's say, you know, to help his brother get back in, in the good graces of uh, society so that he can go back and finish medical school. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
that that's part of the mixed up life that, that he shows here. But yeah, I'm, um, it says near, you know, in the end, Yvette goes to the uh, grandfather and tells him what Duddy's done. And, and that's a, a powerful scene, right? Uh, one of Svi Scholar's best scenes in movies where he said, I don't want a farm here, right? Uh, you know, um, I heard because he heard what, uh, what you did, right? Um, what is the, uh, what's the line? I don't want a lot here. A girl came to see me. Um, you know, you, you think you'll be good to me and that will settle your conscience when you go out and swindle others, right? You know, so um, yeah, I mean, he clearly loves his grandfather did, and he's so upset with her for going to him, the one person he didn't want to disappoint. So, yeah. uh, Linda. Yeah. Um, my, uh, my observation was, and maybe I mis, uh, observed it, but after Virgil was in that uh, accident, didn't he go into a massive depression? He kind of yeah. locked himself up in his room and he, it, he did take it quite badly. I mean, I've known a young man that was like this. You know, he was a wheeler dealer to get whatever he could get out of you. But then he has a good heart when he needs to have a good heart. So I think that's what it is. I think there is a conscience there, but his... His, uh, his models, all of his models were wheeler and dealers, whatever they could get out of you. And then he would laugh. He had that horrible laugh, which was, I got back at you. And that's what yeah. his whole thing was, was to get back at people. Yeah, it's quite a cackle, you know, when, right. when he laughs, right? And uh, right. when he tells uh, the boy wonder to get off his land, right? right? Which... which on some level, we sort of sympathize with with Duddy Kravitz in that scene, right? I mean, that, you know, um, you know, th this is a bad guy, right? right. <laughs> that he's throwing off his land, you know. Um, that depression, yeah. I mean, we don't know how long it lasts exactly, but yeah, the movie definitely shows that. Now, uh, again, the question that is: are, are the motives pure, right? On the one hand. Yeah, I think he's really, you know, Virgil, he talks about Virgil being his friend. I think he really does think of Virgil as a friend. I mean, he really likes Virgil. Um, he feels bad that he put Virgil in that position. Um, but he also knows that, uh, uh, you know, he's essentially bankrupt because of it. You right. Know? But everybody right. is a mark. Excuse me. Everyone is a mark. There is no exceptions. I mean, he took advantage of everyone who reached out to him. And I don't know if that's somebody that's amoral or doesn't have a conscience, but then he shows that he does have a conscience. Right. So I don't know what his personality was supposed to be, uh, but I guess it's, it's something for people to talk about. Yeah, and this is a very hard character to play on screen, okay. right? Because you know, like most movies, we're used to our movies being uh, black and white. Right, remember the westerns, you know, the the black hat and the white hat, right? And there's, uh, you know, the and, and it it's sort of a landmark in westerns when they start to, when when some of the characters start to have gray hats, you know, and not really sure who is he a good guy or a bad guy, right? I mean, it's, uh, um, and that's one of the hardest things to portray, right? Is is the uh, a flawed character, a flawed human being. You know, and of course, we understand that all human beings are flawed human beings. None of us are perfect. Uh, as I often say to people, none of, her, none of us are as bad as the worst thing we've ever done or as good as the best thing we've ever done, right? We're, we, we're somewhere in between. Um, and this is the character. and He's young, right? He's not even old enough to sign the deeds. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, he's so young when you think about it, right? So... Uh, this is a character who um, doesn't know where to turn. And that's literally kind of the last scene in the movie. Not, you know, he's going to go in a direction, but it, we don't know where he's going. He doesn't know where he's going. And, and I think that that's, so um, it, it's a very human thing in some ways. Now, we, we don't want to own it, 
you know, <laughs> uh, and and it's very exaggerated. So, you know, but like you said, you know, someone who has some of these elements, right? Yeah. 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 And he's never going to change. I mean, that's just the way he is. Mm -hmm. But he has a good heart when he thinks he can get something out of you. And then you never know what his motive is. That's, right. You just never know if it's pure of heart or if there's an alternate motive about it. So, and and so if there's a, you know, I I don't know that that Mordecai Richler uh, when he wrote the book or when they made this movie, they really set out to to create something that's a critique of the Jewish community, you know. But if if it is, it it's uh, about people. <laughs> chasing the wrong thing right and so what's missing from this right is uh the moral center of judaism which is what we talk about all the time and because we're members of a congregation in a community we uh, you know this is this is where we want we want our children to get guidance here we want uh, uh, uh our adults as we learn together to grow and uh, and and build our moral center Right. right. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't just happen by accident and uh, it, it can't be left to uh, the marketplace. Right. Oh. To, to make people moral. Right. Uh, morality comes from somewhere else and it's not apparent anywhere in Duddy Kravitz's life. No, not right. at all. The yeah. young man I know had no religious training at all. Yeah. I mean, so I don't think he knows what he is. And so there is no moral compass there. So that's what I see. So, yeah. Well, I think that's an interesting critique, right? That the, uh, the Jewish community needed to take to heart and has taken to heart, right? The, the, we saw it in Hester Street last week, right? You come to America, you become American, you get rid of your talit, you get rid of your hat, you right. get rid of your rituals. You, and, and along with those rituals, goes the moral education that comes along with them right um and so uh so i think i think it's a very interesting slice of canadian jewish life which has some resonance in america as well um some of it is very specifically canadian i think but it's uh you know that's what makes it a worthwhile movie for us to see i think Okay, we're closing up on the hour here, and um, I just want I, to- I'm going to be talking about another controversial Jewish movie, so if you want to yeah. do a double feature, come back at uh, seven o'clock, right? And we're going to talk about A Serious Man, uh, which I didn't intend when we put this class, the, the afternoon classes together, to, to uh, pair those up. I mean, the pair that we're going to watch together is this one. The next week's movie, The Flamingo Kid, um, uh, which covers some similar territory to this, I think, but is a much gentler uh, in some ways kind of movie. Um, and, and, and also, listen, Rabbi, listen. I, I don't know where you found it, but I found it on TV Guide. Here's the link. Hopefully it's a good copy of it. I couldn't find it anywhere else. Really? I thought I had seen it on Amazon originally, but um, maybe. I'll look. Okay. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but I do think the movie is a uh, serious man, though I may not make any direct connections to Duddy Kravitz. It does make an interesting companion piece in a way to, uh, uh a different slice of Jewish life, uh, this time in the, the suburbs in Minnesota in the 1960s. So, uh, so worth a look if you haven't had a chance. We'll talk about that one tonight. Excuse me. I see you. I, as long as we've got adult learners here, I'll mention that in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a live lecture in the, the sanctuary. Tal Schneider, an Israeli journalist, and she's going to be in town for a day. So she's going to come and uh, speak about sort of the new generation of uh, women politicians in Israel um, and how that fits into the new coalition and how it doesn't fit into the new coalition in Israel. It'll, it'll be live in the sanctuary, but it'll also, of course, be uh, available on, on the net as well. So you'll be able to see it from home. But if you'd like to come and join us in person, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, she writes beautifully and she's uh, 
Uh, she's from Israel, but her English is very, very good and very clear. So I, I think you'll enjoy hearing her. So that's okay. December 14th. Um, it's great to see everyone. If you need any links, let me know and uh, be well, be safe. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi.